the very first team that we're going to discuss is Mexico. So, from the port of Veracruz, they sailed on the steamship, the Arizaba, to um, towards the United States. That was their next... Uh, that was where they were going to pick up the US team, but before they reached the United States, they stopped off at Havana in Cuba before uh, they eventually arrived in the in the States um, ar- around, I believe, forgive me if I don't know the exact date, in the first week of June at least, anyway, um, where they stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York and they, they trained with the local side. Um, yeah, so they stayed for two days in the metropolis of, of New York and um, and they, they trained with a local team and they, they um, brought some local balls that were of English manufacture. And uh, the coach, uh, Sarah Younger, he brought this, um, as one account has it, an ornate black bearskin coat because um, for the South American winter because in, in Uruguay during the June, July, it was the winter. So the, the first World Cup was essentially a winter World Cup. That, if that's that's an interesting point there. But they, he adopt, so he adopted this nickname as the bullfighter, the Toriada, because he was quite a a hefty guy quite beefy guy as they say and um, they would they would leave uh, the United States on the 13th of June that's when they were scheduled to uh, to leave and initially all, all the plans were to leave on a ship called the Pan America but eventually it would be the the SS Monago that they were aboard now the SS Monago was a luxury liner uh, traditionally would um, only do tours of uh, the Caribbean region, but th- so this was its first maiden voyage. They had installed recently um, a system to uh, record the temperature of the sea sea water, and this had just newly be uh, newly installed and for this journey south of the equator. And uh, so this is one of the reasons why the SS, they they booked their, sh- uh, their journey on the SS Monago as opposed to initially what would be the Pan America but before they left on the um, the ship south to South America um, they were missing one player um, Francisco Gutierrez the younger brother of the Mexican captain uh, Rafael and it was because he was uh, in, the, in, the, in, in town buying dark glasses sorry dark lenses for his eyeglasses and this was to protect him from as he this was the excuse from the road dust and the sun that he would probably uh, potentially uh, face in South America but so, uh, there's some accounts that the Mexican team were partly illiterate some of them and uh, the Mexican uh, goalkeeper Oscar Bonfiglio he he uh, he would help many of the players fill out their um, paperwork and all that. Their paperwork and their yeah. So for immigration, because um, while the, while there's these references to the Mexican teams being illiterate, all, all, all the manifest, the ship's manifest that they arrived on it on the Arizaba say that they did they were all illiterate. But of course, that could mean there was only two choices: they're either literate or literate that was the only two um uh columns that they had to fill out so because they could partly read some of them they were considered literate even though they 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 weren't fully perhaps educated as much as some of the others in their in the team and um so um also, um, their captain. So they would board. They would eventually board the ship, and they would sail south with the American team. And uh, Oscar Bonfiglio would later um, state that that him and the, the um, not him, sorry, he would later state that there was a a little bit of um, a falling out between the two teams, the Mexicans and the Americans. Uh, it doesn't exactly specify what. Um, Going out as far as uh, they, they didn't get along or there were problems, frictions and all that or... 
Well, th- this is the thing. It's not very specific what he says, and um, it was an, he did an in- he did an interview. There's one article that says it, he, he recorded this in his diary, but I contacted him, his grandson. He says that his, his grandson said he never kept a diary, but he he, he just um, states that they, they had a falling out, and uh, it doesn't specify what. But there were, there were no two there were no photographs of the two teams. Uh, um, appearing together in the same mm-hmm. photograph and so that would kind of suggest what it is maybe it was a cultural thing um, yeah. a language con- thing maybe because in contrast uh, when France Belgium and Romania uh, were on the Conte Verde there's that famous photograph of all three teams posing together yes and there's did you notice there's actually um, a fourth team in that picture at the front there's Who actually a fourth yeah, there's in the in the front row, sitting down in front of uh, George Romain, the captain. Uh, if you're talking about the big picture, they're more than their right, kit. Right. There's actually a fourth team in the picture, right at the front. Now, a bit there's a bit of a mystery there um, as to who they were, and I've tried to f- figure out if if they were um, a team that had come on board at one of the stops to take a photograph with George Romain. Because uh, they, when they stopped off in Barcelona, there um, there was a French team playing in Barcelona called Red Red Star, and they oh, were actually uh, and uh, Jules Rimmer had actually I think that was the club he had initially founded, and I thought initially they they had come on board um, at Barcelona to take a photograph, or there was some club in Brazil when they stopped off in Brazil. It's not the Brazilians, we know that because even though, but someone someone told me that it potentially could have been. Um, the t- the football team of the, the Conte Verde, the ship's football team, made up of the staff of the the ship, because a lot of these ships, these ocean liners, would have their own football teams that they would every every port they'd go to, they'd play just you know pick up matches with the, for for the local side. So that's an, so that that photograph is another uh, one of those things, a mystery which is yet to be um, solved. But you're right about the. Um, but you're right about how the, these three other teams did manage to get along. Yeah. So while Bonfiglio never actually states what went on, it may have been just, who knows, a, a language barrier, a misunderstanding, you know, an impression. I, I think actually st- he states, if I, I haven't actually got the, um, the notes with me here, right here, but I think he calls the American snobs. That's the word he used. Um, but nonetheless, they, 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 there's this descriptions that the the, um, the boat was uh, a place where, while it had certain modern amenities, they, they were a bit disappointed with the the um, the food and and the um, the bathrooms. Um, on on the ship, so on the ship they were um, the coach. He would um, to avoid the players become stiff and um, and stat- static on the boat he, his training regime included um, he would assemble them on deck of the ship and they would uh, do skip in with rope uh, they would uh, jog around the boat uh, they would do gymnastics and they would um, they would they would they tried to do some ball training but they had to tie uh, uh, rope to the ball and and have it attached to a mast that, that's the the extent of which they um, try to uh, do some training and stuff and there was also um, a swimming pool on board that they could use as well right. so basically everything but training with the ball essentially yeah and all the teams had trouble with this basically yeah. um, so the, um, the Mexicans they would as they made their way south they would um stop off uh, in Rio de Janeiro and where they would stay for it, one account has them staying for three nights but I think it, they arrived on the 28th and left on the 1st of July I think if I'm if my, if I'm, my memory serves me right um, and they took in very sightseeing uh, facilities and they would train at uh, uh, Fleminese when the no but sorry they would train at Botafogo which and because of um, they would develop a relationship with the, the the Brazilian club 
um, they would reach uh, Rio de Janeiro on the 28th of June and uh, they where they would uh, take in some of the sites and um, they would uh, train at the grounds of Botafogo FC uh, and uh, it, they developed a long French lasting friendship with that Brazilian club what do you mean by two. that like, as, in terms of they would play friendlies in the future or what is yeah and uh, arranged tours and uh, that's why I, I think that that's what they mean I think by that and some yeah some sorts of association of um, the, the, the words used are just a long lasting friendship right. so you would imagine you would imagine that it would mean um, how long it lasted I don't know um, but uh, one Brazilian newspaper um, Diario oh, excuse me one Brazilian paper called Dario de Noite they interviewed uh, the Mexican coach and it's quite interesting what he says um, because he said that um, the Mexicans they had no intention or how should I say they had no they had no real ambitions that they would succeed in the World Cup and that essentially this was um, a learning uh, learn experience a learn them, yeah yeah, learning process and uh, and yeah, and that bore out on the results at the World Cup. That I guess they're probably, f I guess, yeah, they lost all their matches, a very heavy defeat against Argentina, and uh, yeah, so first round elimination was no surprise, I can imagine, for them. Well, he, some of the words he used uh, is that we don't uh, arrive with any signification of material achievements, and that his players only only arrive with bits of their soul and and their boots but he was um he was very much against the professional ideology of the, that was creeping into the game i guess uh, for mexico not only for mexico but uh, for all the other teams in fact we can pretty much uh, say we have to remind everyone that most teams basically uh, didn't even want to participate and they had to you know be cajoled into participating and, uh, uh, so. yeah no absolutely and um, he the Mexican coach for instance says that um, where's the expressions he used uh, that he states my motherland wished to honor the Uruguayan Federation initiative and that was enough for us to be on our way but for, for the other countries uh, it the time of the tournament the the longevity of getting there for, so for instance the Mexicans it took them 26 days just to get there yeah. uh, Europeans it was like two weeks for the travel two weeks back and that's like uh, and a month in between so we're talking like two well, or three months away yeah well it would for most for a lot of the teams it would it would extend to like three months because they would um uh but would play friendly matches in order to try and uh, recoup some of the finances that right. um the feder the football federations were 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 ha had to find in order to pay uh, yeah. some of these players and their costs and stuff like that so um as I said, for the Mexicans, it, it took them 26 days. And even though Sarionga was a man who uh, believed that the, the creeping professionalism was destroying the modern game, and it's, it's very strange that even in this era that there was these concerns, he, uh, for him, uh, he 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 would tell this newspaper that he, he recorded the time. Uh, the period of amateurism in, in, in the game that he played as a time of gold, a golden time and all that he needed was the colours of his club and the heart of his beloved because he would he would play he, he would have a, he, would, he would try and perform for the, uh, a woman in the crowd that he, he particularly liked so this creeping professionalism he he sort of despised that he he thought was uh, getting paid he would suspend them from the squad but um, the problem is that we know that one of the players, at least Mexico's Juan Carreno, who scored for Mexico in the 1928 Olympics, he was someone who, who, uh, who, who, while in Mexican football you had to have a, a job, 
so to speak uh, and in order to play football you had to do, he he never would he would he would never do the job that he he was given he he, he believed that this this job was for oxen it was you know oxen do the the, the field work so to speak and that he only played football right. and he's an inter- he's an interesting character because he uh would bet a lot on football he had, he had a he used to gamble a lot on football he used to gamble against the opposing team he was playing against that he his team would win and he would get up to all sort of antics on the field such as uh distractory tactics like pulling down his shorts while his 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 um fellow player was um shooting a goal just to distract the defenders and this one particular game in which he bet on with the opposing team he uh he, he said to them look instead of because they won the match he said instead of paying me what you owe me you can pay off my debt at the uh at the bordello which he used to frequent a lot <laughs> and, he, and he and he apparently had a relationship with uh with the the madam of the the bordello called uh, maria de limon and they, they apparently had a relationship so uh he was someone that gambled a lot he was someone that used to visit the uh the uh bordellos and uh he he didn't he he didn't like to work he didn't like to get take his money from his job to play because the obviously invariably the the um, the football team he played for would invariably be connected to a company that owned 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 the football team so he he would only just play football so he so this idea that so wrong uh, the Mexican coach had was is a bit at odds with what we know about this this individual player but when they did get to Uruguay um, the uh, they got a visit from uh, one of the Uruguayan players, um, uh, Lorenzo Fernandez, uh-huh. who knew who knew one of the uh, the Mexican players. Lorenzo Fernandez, the Uruguayan player, he was friends with the Mexican captain, uh, uh, known as Record Garza Gutierrez. Right, Record right. was his was his nickname yeah. and. And when he saw, and Gutierrez was actually a tall player. He was he was way way over six feet tall. But when uh, Lorenzo Fernandez saw the um, other players, he said that um, because they were quite short and um, and and thin, he said that they it seemed that they come to to the World Cup with kids. And the average the average weight of the uh, of the players Mexican players were around sixty kilograms. So. Um, there's there's also stories that they went to um, train at um, the what was called the Colegio Pio, the, the religious college, and well they did go and play uh, train there and at uh, Club Olympia. And there's one story that hasn't been chucked out because um, he uh, apparently the the coach would swear a lot, but I, I haven't found uh, that that to back it up. But um, he they will. Uh, the Mexican coach uh, wanted to base the um, the team quite far outside the city in the suburb of, of Colón because he wanted them to be away from the bigger um, distractions of the city And but when you had a player like um, uh, Juan Carreno I, 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 maybe that was the reason why he wanted to keep him out of the main city to, to avoid the distractions that um, Carreno had there's another story of there's another story of um, another player, Mapache Rodriguez, Raimundo Rodriguez. All the Mexican players have these nicknames like um, Chacuitas, which means jackets, Record, Mapache, uh, Nicho. They, they all, all of them had these nicknames that meant something. But uh, this one player, Raimundo, Raimundo Rodriguez, he uh, he was based, he lived in Mexico on the, in, uh, on the Gulf of Mexico in Tampico, which was a very hot place. And he found the the South American conditions, while well, the Euro in the conditions in Montevideo very cold, um, that he would dress himself from head to toe in all these bandages that he could find, or, or clothes. And some say some say he used bandages, some say he just wrapped himself in all these clothes. But he he um, he became to be known as uh, La Mamia, the Mummy, because he looked. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. So um, apparently, one player was. Uh, um, Frightened when he walked into the same room that he shared with him and saw him wrapped up, and apparently, so Mexico's Honestly, first match. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say Mexico's, like you said, the first match was against France, and the 
famous uh, Lucien Laurent g- goal that is the f- soon to be the very first goal of the World Cup and uh, uh, basically like you said Mexico were basically d- unprepared as far as uh, or maybe didn't have their head into this tournament more than the others perhaps but well, uh, they, yeah they, they, they weren't as technically um, perhaps ready or quit uh, compared to the other other teams obviously they, they, they they'd, they'd gone to to the 1928 Olympics and and were, were beaten heavily uh, 7-1 in their first game against Spain I believe um, so there wasn't much to expect but um, and as I said earlier about their coach Juan Serralonga he he um, he was someone that was um, employed essentially because he was considered a great motivator and um, and even though they had low expectations coming into the tournament uh, uh, he tried to motivate his players before the match with the uh, with, with, a, with certain appeals to religious saints and he also uh, before the, the French game he invoked uh, the victory of Mexican forces over the French army during the Battle of Puebla on May the 5th 1865 which is more commonly known today I'm sure you're aware of this living in, in Los Angeles uh, known as Cinco de Mayo Cinco de Mayo yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, so this is what that single uh, is based on this French, this Mexican French battle at the Battle right. of Puebla. So he, because and um, because they're playing against France, he evokes this major battle, and he plays the gramophone of the Mexican national ant- anthem, and he gets he gets some very worked up, and by the time they get onto the pitch, they're kind of some of them are quite apparently quite emotionally in tears because they <laughs> they've been stoked up so much, and but um, but as the game unfolded, they um. That uh, they would ultimately go down one 0 in the first ninety minutes through uh, Lucien Laurent, right. uh, and, and then um, they uh, by half time they were three 0 down. They would eventually get a goal through Carreno, Juan Carreno, that um, that um, that maverick of a player. Um, but uh, the the tactics, as, as, as apparently that that Sarah Sor- Younger employed his team to play by and and this is very much goes to that um the what was the role of coaches in this time and what, what can we discern and what can we we know about them because <coughs> we know certain examples of other players making reference to having uh, no real instruction there was no chalkboard that they had learned by but but he apparently told his players to to try and shoot from any distance that they possibly could. So a pattern starting to emerge in their, their, their games, which they would, whenever they get a sight on goal, they would shoot from any distance. So there was a lot of long shots at goal, which which didn't particularly, uh, yeah. perhaps could, could be considered. Yeah, they, I mean they probably potentially wasted other other potential build-up play. I guess you know they they, they may not have. Uh, I'm sure there were some other talented players they had but if they're going to shoot from such fast distances they're not perhaps uh, um, using always the right option if there was a pass that may be a player unmarked they they wouldn't go for that they would just go for the shot on goal if they saw it so um, and uh, I guess their next match with uh, Argentina was riddled with penalty kicks basically I think there's like four or five uh well, actually, the the, the, um, the next match actually was against Chile. Oh, Chile! On the 16th. Sorry, yeah. The Argentina was the next one, right? Right. Sorry. Yeah, and and that and that that, that was Chile's first game, and and uh, it's it's strange, isn't it? Because they played Mexico in their, their first game. The next game in that group should have been really Argentina and um, Chile, but it would turn out to be they would face the Chileans next. And the Chilean uh, the Chilean team were um, they came up against an experienced Chilean team. They they, they decided to play mainly their um, their senior players. I don't know if it was because they were resting the younger players for the. Um, other matches against France, but um, it, I guess if, if if there's one uh, uh, landmark about that uh, game would be that it contained the first World Cup own goal, and it was um, scored by uh, Manuel Rojas against um, 
against his own goalkeeper Isidio Isidrio Sota so I mean the Chileans won 3-0 I think Kakas Vidal scored the other two goals for Chileans but uh, again uh, so you know the, the, uh, Manuel Rosas has, has got the record of scoring the first World Cup own goal I think he he headed it past he passed the keeper um, the Mexican team I think uh, it, it, just as a side note what was curious about this team that they had brothers in 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 that in that squad we know about the uh francisco gutierrez and uh gaza gutierrez they were two brothers and we had the rosas brothers felipe and manuel rosas but we also have another set of brothers in in this mexican team and that's the goalkeeper who replaced Bonfiglio for this game his name was as I mentioned uh, Isidoro I can't say his name now Isidoro Sota he was the brother of the uh, Mexican Federation President or Delegation Chief Ernesto Sota who who, who headed the team in Uruguay and he was a former player so we have actually three pairs of brothers in that Belgian um, Mexican Mexican delegation which um which is another one of those little uh, curious facts that you could always um, add about that, that team. Um, uh, so yeah, as as you said, um, so they'd lost three nil. Uh, they lost four one to Mex- uh, France in their first France. game. They and they lost three nil to Chile. And surprisingly, before they went into that next uh, the game against Argentina, they were still technically in the competition because Mexico because Argentina were only playing their second game and and Chile played France that day as well and that was Chile's second game as well right. so while Fr- France and Mexico had played twice so because so they were technically still in a tournament but from from that from one point of view but again, like you said there's there's um coming back to those uh this issues we had about the first World Cup about what's actually true, what's been exaggerated, what's um, been misrepresented. It, you know, another issue is this game, which is apparently, according to some sources, had five penalties um, taken. I, mean, I think you just alluded it just before, didn't you? Um, I didn't. I don't know if you wanted to say something first. Uh, no, I was just gonna say that it's uh, the the game is I guess known for being having so many uh, penalty kicks, uh, and I guess but it's again some sources say four, some sources uh, sources say five. Um, who really knows? Um, and uh, you know, what but else is there? As, but but for what I can determine, say because France played Chile on that same day in the um, Estadio Centenario and uh, and they played just before the Mexico-Argentina game in that game there was a penalty awarded um, but it was missed right. so and in the following game actually while well, you say that like you say there's some sources say four some sources say five I think if I'm correct there's only actually three penalties awarded uh, and and it and it goes to the Bolivian coach who was who was refereeing this game, Ulises Sacedo. Uh, two were awarded to Mexico and one to Argentina. Um, uh, the Argentinian penalty apparently was missed or saved by the keeper Bonviglio, who got his place back in the team. But some sources say that um, the penalty taken by Fernando Pantanosta was purposely missed because it, they felt the penalty was unjustified but looking at some of the sources I've read it, it, it doesn't seem that's the case but um, and two awarded to, to the Mexicans and uh, one was scored by Manuel Rosas who, who'd um, scored the own goal in the game previously and one was saved by um, the Argentinian keeper Bossio but Rosas had um, converted the rebound from the the save, oh, so so again, uh, as far as we can see, there's only three penalties awarded in that game, one penalty awarded in the game previously. So I don't know if there's 
because they were played on the same day that someone's mixed up like this That's report possible. of okay. you know it's also reported that um that one of the penalties was taken from um wasn't actually taken from the penalty spot it, it was a few yards back because they couldn't discern uh the, the penalty spot had apparently been faded away apparently oh. so the, the uh, um the uh bolivian referee had to um take an educated guess of where he thought the penalty he should have taken and there's actually a photograph of this penalty and it does look quite far out um and so i, I say a photograph what i mean by that is that is a photograph from behind uh you have Bossio standing on the goal line Rosas and uh, taking the penalty and it's not been taken yet but you can see the ball it looks quite f- far from the goal line so it, it's possible apparently he estimated it by by taking paces from the goal line and doing t- 12 paces and because he was such a tall tall um the referee was quite tall is is they believe that his his steps were a bit too large for the average step that you would take that it, it, right. it meant that it was a lot further out so um yeah um so, so eventually so the game ended um six, so there's that cute six three in the end and uh and that was unusual so the the, the mexicans had um managed to score three against Argentina which was quite impressive really and okay two of them came from sort of penalties uh, and one of the goals that they conceded from Stabile uh, uh, I think it was uh, Bonfiglia it was a high ball that Bonfiglia went for he missed it and Stabile headed it in and uh, uh, Juan Luque Saralonga he um, he uh, he basically had a uh had a go at the Bonfiglio after the match and saying, you know, what happened? He, he was swearing at him apparently, um, uh, and uh, and Bonfiglio apparently said, I couldn't see it because of the sun, and he made reference, well, do you want us to play the game at night then? You know, it's it's it, it, that's one of those little anecdotes that apparently um, from Serionga, this he's quite because he's quite a centric character. Ultimately. Um, they would go out the tournament. Um, they, they, after that defeat, they were out. They played all three matches. They conceded. They scored four and conceded eleven. No, sorry, not eleven. Uh, six, ten, you're thirteen. Thirteen, sorry, yeah. They conceded thirteen, and apparently, um, they they had arranged to go on a tour of Chile and Peru. But before they left Montevideo, they parted ways with the the, the Spanish-born coach Juan Serralonga. So he got apparently got his marching orders, so to speak. Um, he was essentially fired. He made his way back, his his, his own way back to Mexico, while they went on on their tour of um, of Chile and Peru. If 